I hope that your summer is off to a good start. Uh, I know that in the Blackford house, uh, it's off to a good start. Uh, the kids, Axel and Jack, just finished two weeks of swim lessons, and I can already see the confidence level building in my kids once they get in the water. Axel loves to jump in the pool and swim around with goggles on, uh, and now Jack is uh, putting his foot in and uh, loving to uh, float around with his floaty. And we've also discovered water balloons so far this summer, and uh, the kids love water balloons. And so dad's fingers are getting hurt while he's like tying all these balloons, and Amy too. And we're teaching the kids, though, to uh, not just enjoy the balloons, but to also pick up the little pieces of the water balloons. Remember that? If you're, when your kids were young, or if you have young kids, it's not just uh, enjoying the balloons, but picking up those little, little pieces. So the summer is off to a start. I hope you're enjoying the start of summer here at Lord of Life. Uh, the summer is off to a great start. Just yesterday... A team from our church, people uh, that came here, uh, they painted the lower level. And they added some beautiful bright colors uh, to the space down there. Maybe some of you have never been downstairs, but this is our children and youth area. And it really needed some love. So take a look uh, at the pictures. There's some beautiful bright colors. There's orange and green and blue and this white cream color. And yesterday, uh, the team painted uh, and painted and painted. And so uh, those carpet squares you see right there, uh, those are going to be uh, taken out. And we're going to add new carpet squares uh, that match the color of the walls. And all of this is funded from the leftovers we had from our 25 years and beyond campaign. Uh, we know that God cares about children. Amen? And so we also, as a church, want to minister to children and provide them a vibrant space to learn about the Lord. So these are exciting things that are happening. I just want you to be aware that uh, also there's going to be a uh, a large uh, flat screen TV. Uh, you can see the CRT screen there in the top left. So we're going to replace that with a large flat screen TV. We're going to get into the modern times uh, downstairs. So that's an update. Uh, we are in a sermon series uh, this summer called Following Jesus in Our Busy Lives. And we're going through the Gospel of Mark chapter by chapter. And we're learning from Jesus how he stayed connected to God when he was so busy doing ministry. What were the speed bumps that he included in his life to slow down and have a relationship with God? We want to learn from Jesus. We want to accept those speed bumps for our lives today. So we've been calling them speed bumps, and today we're in chapter 7. And today in chapter 7, Jesus is extremely busy. In fact, he travels 100, get this, 125 miles by foot, not by car, right? By foot. And he's going all over the place. And I want to show you uh, where he went. Take a look at the map on the screen. Uh, there we have the Gennesaree, and that's where he starts. It's just a little bit away from his hometown. And then Jesus, in Mark chapter 7, he travels up from the Gennesaree to Tyre. And this is a very wealthy area. And then he goes up to Sidon. And then he finishes this chapter at the bottom here. Take a look at this next one and the Decapolis, and uh, that's an area, and most of this area is all Gentile territory, non-Jews, and Jews consider these people to be unclean, and Jesus is performing ministry uh, to them because he came for them. He came for all people. So lots happening in this chapter. Uh, so what happens in chapter 7? Take a look here. Jesus teaches about traditions. He teaches about inner purity. He casts out a demon from a girl, and he opens the ears of a deaf man who also uh, is uh, nearly, he's mute. He, he's not able to speak. So Jesus opens up the man's ears and loosens his tongue so that he can talk. So we're going to apply all of these sections to our lives today. And the first thing we really need to learn is that Jesus in this chapter sh shows us his mission for the whole world. For all people, men, women, children, clean and unclean people, Jews and Gentiles. It's all in this chapter. And so a big takeaway that we're going to start with is this, that Jesus came to reach the whole world, the whole world. And that should really be an emphasis for us as we get going today in chapter 7. Now for Muslims today, they believe that Jesus came as a prophet only to the Jews, but what we see in chapter 7 is that he came as the Lord for the whole world. In fact, it's in this chapter of Mark, and it's the only place in the Gospel of Mark where someone calls Jesus Lord. 
a woman. We're going to learn from her a little bit later on. She's a Greek, and she calls Jesus Lord. Jesus came for the whole world. And if he came for the whole world, then the church must have the same heart to reach the whole world. Amen? This must be our heart as well. If this is the heart of Jesus, it must be our heart to reach the youth, the children, the young adults, the adults, the elderly, people of all races, ethnicities, deaf, blind, mute, all people for Jesus. This must be your heart and my heart. And here's the problem. If we go too fast in life, we can start to have mission creep. Mission creep is when we start to lose sight of why we're here. Why we're here as the church. We're not here to just go through traditions. We're here to be fed and reach people for Christ Jesus. We're on a mission. The mission of Christ. And so when we get back and we slow down and we get back on track with Jesus' mission, then we start to have a vision for our life. A vision for why we're here. A vision of what God's doing so that we also, no matter what our vocation, truck driver, doctor, banker, you can serve the Lord Jesus Christ in your vocation because you are here to love people to Christ. So that's what this is about. It's about reaching the whole world and having this mission in our heart, accepting it for ourselves. When the church gets away from the mission, it becomes so dangerous because we can easily just become a club. And that's not what God came to do. So when we catch up with Jesus in Mark chapter 7, he is near his hometown, and he's with his disciples, and he's teaching, and the Pharisees who are in Jerusalem, not too far away, they send spies to Jesus. They want to know if he's doing things the way that they think he should be doing them. So they investigate Jesus, and they don't like what they find. Because Jesus and his disciples are not washing their hands, their pots, their kettles in a ceremony like they are. So they're very critical of Jesus. And you heard that in the gospel reading, didn't you? And so Jesus really lays it into them. He really lays it into them. He calls them hypocrites. He tells them that they're way off track. And this is one of the moments in Mark where we have the greatest amount of confrontation between Jesus verbally and the Pharisees. And this is what is written. You have a fine way, Jesus said, of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. So these Pharisees has, have elevated the traditions of the elders above the word of God. And this angers Jesus because these Pharisees are saying that they're clean before God as long as they're clean on the outside. That's a bunch of hogwash, right? God knows that we are clean when we're clean on the inside. When our hearts are pure before him. Clean on the inside and the outside. So take a look at this. For from within, Jesus said, out of a man's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, Malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, and arrogance out of men's hearts. All of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So there's a lot in here. We're going to start with traditions. We all have traditions, and you have uh, personal traditions. I'm sure maybe you eat during a certain time at night. Uh, maybe you have a specific family vacation you go every year. I know for us, we have traditions in our house. Uh, Amy and the kids, uh, they like to go to Minnesota during Christmas time and make Corv and Ludafisk. They're Scandinavian, and yeah, I stay here, okay? And I preach, and I get a little R&R, &R, and they go to the family, and the whole family uh, makes this, uh, this meal. And so, uh, but these are traditions. You have traditions, and, and so do I. We also have Christian traditions. And if we're not careful, our traditions, our Christian traditions, can elevate above God's word. And we must be careful that that doesn't happen. This happened during Luther's day. It became very dangerous. The Pope sold indulgences to people so that they could have less punishment and purgatory. The whole thing was heretical. And it bound people's conscience. And Luther knew it. So he spoke out against it. And he started the Reformation so that people would know the truth that there is no purgatory. There's just heaven and hell. 
and that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, by the power of his blood shed on that cross. That is the truth. But the traditions of the church were leading people astray. But there are good traditions. Hear this out. There are good traditions that support your faith in Jesus. And so I'm going to give you criteria right now. I invite you to write this down. Criteria to identify good traditions. The first one is this. Good traditions shine a spotlight on God's word. They shine a spotlight on God's word. And for us, uh, we know that it doesn't say in the Bible for us to pray the Lord's Prayer each and every week during worship. But you know what? It's our tradition to pray the Lord's Prayer each and every week because it's the Word of God. This is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And when we include it, it becomes part of our spirit. It becomes part of how we pray. And it shines a spotlight on the Word of God in our heart. That's a tradition that shines the spotlight. The next one is this. Good traditions move us to obedient service. Obedient service. A wedding is a tradition that hopefully starts husband and wife obediently serving one another and God with their entire being together. Another tradition that Jesus made clear is that the Sabbath is a day to rest, but it's also a day to do good. The religious leaders and elders of Jesus' day, they created 600-something laws to restrict people from really doing anything. So they were so bound that they really wouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. Jesus came along, and he disrupted things. He turned the Sabbath into a day to not just rest, but to do good. So he healed people on the Sabbath. He cast out demons on the Sabbath. He picked grains of wheat to feed the disciples and the followers as they were doing ministry. He did good on the Sabbath. So get this. The Sabbath is not a day of laziness. It's a day of rest. And when the opportunity presents itself, to do good. So if your brother or sister is sick in the hospital, on the Sabbath, go visit them. If you're thirsty and your neighbor is thirsty, give your neighbor something to drink. If your neighbor needs help, if he's stuck in a pit somewhere and he needs to get out, help him out, Jesus said. Do good. This is all about tradition that leads us to obedient service to God. Many of you serve here at Lord of Life. Maybe it's once a week. Maybe it's once a month. This is a tradition that leads you to obedient service to God. So that's the second criteria. The third one is this. Good traditions help our heart sing. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to use an organ in worship. But if an organ leads people to praise God and sing to his name, then so be it. In fact, Psalm 150 lists several different instruments. A flute, a harp, a lyre, many things to praise God with instrument. So we must not get tied down or restrict ourselves with only a certain instrument. And some churches do. They think this is the only way from heaven to worship God, right? So we need to be careful that these are traditions and they help our hearts sing. So we use a keyboard, piano, guitar, microphone. It helps our heart to sing to the Lord. So these are three criteria for good traditions. It's important that you uh, follow these in your own life so that you don't elevate traditions above God's word. So from here, Jesus transitions into a really relevant topic for today, and that is inner purity. Inner purity. I want to start by saying this, that through faith in Jesus Christ, you have already been made pure in your heart. The perfection of Christ has been imputed to you, given to you, and now God sees you as his children, no longer as enemies. You are now the children of God because of the grace of God. Okay, I want to make that very clear. But here's something really important that Christians miss. And that is we're also called to follow Jesus. Not just to believe in him, but also to follow Jesus. And when we follow him, it's also a commitment to move away and remove things that cause us to sin, that pollute our mind and our lives. We don't want to be polluted. For the, we want to be pure for the Lord, right? So it's important that we commit our way to remove those things. So if you have a 
history of alcohol abuse. Inner purity includes kicking the bottle to the curb. If you have a history of looking at questionable websites, it means kicking those sites to the curb. If you have a history of gossip and slander against your neighbor, that's not inner purity, right? Begin to think pure thoughts about your neighbor and control and guard your lip for the Lord Jesus. Inner purity matters. And it's miserable to live with lies and confusion, right? We want to live in the truth. I was meeting with a youth of our church uh, this last week, and I hadn't talked to her uh, yet about faith. As long as I've been here, we haven't talked one-on-one about faith. But her parents wanted me to meet with her just to talk to her and see what's going on in her heart. They felt that she was troubled. So I talked to her and I said, so uh, do you believe in Jesus? And uh, she said, yes, I do. And then I said, do you want to follow Jesus? And she showed some reservation. And I said, those two are different things. One is believing in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, another one is following him where he leads. And in a world filled with lies and deception, he's going to lead you to the truth, but it's not going to be popular. It's not going to be what everyone else does. But you will have peace in your heart. And we talked about what's going on in her life, and it was a great conversation. And if you want to pursue inner purity, it's believing in Jesus, but it's also following Jesus. Where he leads, faith is built on truth. So the more that we're in the truth, the more our faith will flourish in a world that, quite frankly, doesn't value the things of God at all. What it comes down to is it's a battle for your mind. It's a battle for your mind. And there is an agenda out there to steer you away from the truth that God's established in the world. See, here's the thing. Being mission-minded, it captures it well, that phrase, Because it's a battle for your mind. And the truth that's under attack today, more than anything else, is the order that God's established in our world. It's already established, but the world is attacking it venomously. These are things like the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage between one man and one woman, established at creation. The sanctity of sexuality, being pure before marriage. The sanctity of gender, the gender on your birth certificate that God established at the beginning. These things are under attack. And the world wants us to be silent about this. But at the very beginning of the Bible, God is not silent. The first three chapters are very clear that God's order is here for our good. And so inner purity, following these things that God has established, will give us purity in our hearts, purity in our mind, and will help us to live mission-minded for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's so important that we hold firm to the truth, that we're people of grace, but that we also pursue inner purity and remove the things that lead us astray. It's important that you're alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, even online. He prowls around. So be careful online. Don't give in to the divisive rhetoric on social media because it's a trap. The way people talk on social media, there's nothing to hold them accountable to what they say. So be careful that you don't join in the divisive rhetoric. Don't bully others. And don't join in, right, to the hateful speech. You hold firm to the truth in your own life and follow Jesus. Show others an example by the way you live and that you are accountable to the one and only God himself. So be very careful. I love what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Uh, He said this. He said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. He said these things because there's a battle for your mind. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, would you say the yellow part with me? Think about such things. Think about such things. And I'll tell you today, church, that we really need to speak into our youth about this. There's a book I came across. It's called Screens and Teens. Connecting with our kids in a wireless world. I don't know if you've noticed, but everywhere you go, people are like this. Have you noticed that? 
What are they looking at? What are they reading? What's the message in their mind? Youth today, teens primarily, spend an average of three hours a day on their phone. On their phone. There's a battle for the mind. What's influencing them? So this fall, as a church, we're going to talk about screens and teens. We're going to invite parents and grandparents to a discussion because we care. The world doesn't care, but we care what they're looking at. We know that the cell phone is a great tool, but it can also be used for evil. Kids are getting addicted today. So we must speak the truth in love because it's about inner purity for the Lord, Jesus Christ. Jesus, he moves from Tyre, he moves up to Sidon, which is way up north. And then he goes down, and he goes down to the Decapolis. But while he's in Tyre, the city of Tyre, it's a very wealthy city. And it's a port city uh, of the Greek Empire during Jesus' day. And there's a lot of commerce happening there. So Jesus goes up uh, to bring the message of God and to love these people for Jesus, uh, for God's sake. Uh, He's going to uh, uh, not judge them, but love them. And so there's this woman there who has a daughter. And the daughter's demon-possessed. And this woman goes to Jesus and asks for his help. And they have this strange conversation about dogs and breadcrumbs. I'm not going to get into that today. But what we learn is that Jesus, he meets her request. And he casts out this demon. And what's powerful is that that girl who's demon-possessed is not even in their presence. She is far away at at the home. So Jesus' word, what we learn, his power over evil transcends distance. It transcends time. And if you have kids and they're not at home, pray for your kids. Pray the word of God for your children because God's power transcends distance. This woman went to war for her daughter and the Lord delivered, even though Jesus wasn't in the physical presence of this daughter. So go to war for your kids, even if they're not at home. If they are at home, Go to war for your kids because Jesus is in your midst. And Jesus has power and he meets our requests. Don't give up hope. I love this. Jesus' mission is to all ages, worldwide. I love Jesus' first resurrection that he performs in the Gospel of Mark is to a little girl. His mission is to all ages, worldwide. So turn to his word for you and your children. Whether they're older children or younger children, Don't give up on them. Wherever you are, you'll have power over evil. So then Jesus, he goes down from Tyre and Sidon. He goes back down to the Decapolis. And this is really an amazing part of this chapter. Because the last time that we saw Jesus near the Decapolis, he cast out a legion of demons from a man. And then uh, he sent those demons into pigs. Remember that in chapter 5? And those pigs went off the cliff. That was a lot of pork, right, that went into the sea. And uh, there's Jesus, and he's told to leave. Before he leaves, he tells this man who's free of the demons to go and to tell his family what God has done. And instead, the man goes and tells the Decapolis what God has done. Ten cities. This man is so excited about Jesus. And Jesus now returns in Mark 7 to the Decapolis, and people know about him. They know what he's up to. They've heard about him. The word has spread about Jesus. And so some friends bring their deaf friend to Jesus. And they ask him to heal him, to open his ears. So Jesus takes some mud. This is interesting. And then he spits. He puts his fingers into the deaf man's ears. And he says in Aramaic, Ephatha, be opened. And the man's ears are opened. And he touches his tongue. And the man's tongue is loosed so he can speak. And this is powerful because Jesus is fulfilling the mission given to him 600 years ago by the prophet Isaiah. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue Sing for joy. Notice that this deaf man isn't the agent of change. 
He didn't go to Jesus asking Jesus to open his ears. It was the friends who brought this deaf man to Jesus. And notice it was the mother who went to war for her daughter. And in Mark chapter 3, it's the friends of the paralytic who bring their friend to Jesus. Here's the message. Support your friends. Don't give up on them. If they need hope and they've got nothing left, go to them and bring them a living hope in Jesus. This is how it works in the gospel, is that we bring people to Jesus with our actions, our words. I was just watching a video about how a man's going through cancer, and he shared the thing that's getting him through this, this chemo, is the encouragement and support of his Christian friends who are giving him hope that he can be healed in this life. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, brings healing in this life. So we must not give hope. Did you know that the number one unchurched demographic in our world today are the deaf? 95% of deaf people don't attend church. When I went to seminary in St. Louis, part of my training was to visit uh, a demographic that isn't usually present in a Lutheran church. And mine was a church that had sign language, a community that praised the God. It was uh, praised God with the unison of their hands. Wouldn't that be awesome to see people praise the Lord with the unity and the unison of their hand movements? And it was great. The pastor preached with sign language. And I have a vision for our church that someday we will provide sign language services so that the deaf of our community will praise the name of Almighty God together with the whole church. That they will be included in our services. And there's churches that do this. If this is something that intrigues you, that the Lord's tugging on your heart, I'd love to talk to you about this. It takes more than just start again. It takes a plan. But I'd love to see that happen at our church. This is being mission-minded, reaching people for the gospel, people who otherwise don't already praise his name. So to wrap up today, Jesus, he performs ministry at home to people who think they're close to God but are really far from God. And then he goes to Tyre, Sidon, and to the Decapolis, and he performs ministry to people far from God, but they come to know God through Jesus. And so for us, we need to do ministry here at home and also around the world. So my prayer is that you will be mission-minded. The takeaway from today, the speed bump, is to live mission-minded. And I love that last part, mind, because it's a battle for your mind. So be mission-minded. Minded where you are, where you work, wherever you go for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's capture every moment for him so that everyone will know the grace and truth of Jesus. Amen? Amen. For next week, read Mark chapter 8. And let's close with prayer. Please join me. Lord God, thank you so much for Jesus' mission. Lord, we pray and we know that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. So, Lord, keep us from mission creep. Lord, keep us focused on your mission. Help us, Lord, to have a love for lost people, to have a love for unclean people, to have a love, Lord, for our family, our children. And keep us pure along the way. Give us pure thoughts. Give us pure motives. Remove anything that's evil from our hearts. Lord, help us. We thank you that you have helped us by sending us Jesus who came to not only save us from our sin, but he also came to purify us from unrighteousness, to purify our mind and our heart from unrighteousness. So sanctify us, Holy Spirit, by your truth. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.